Welcome to TMI, a podcast by Henry Ford Allegiance Health. And today we have a great episode. Uh, Tim is on the couch again. Hello, Dave. Hey, how you doing? Good. You're you're like the official co-host now, aren't you? Uh, apparently, I am. I've been, yeah. uh, been on a few more times lately. So, did you have a good holiday? I did. Yeah, it's been it's been busy. Um, keeping in touch with family and all that kind of stuff. Um, we we play, we stayed mostly by ourselves, but you know the kids running around the house. Yes, a little bit of a headache out there. Yeah, um, it's it's fun. It's a little bit of chaos though too with all the mm-hmm. holidays and getting presents and shopping and it's just like rush, rush, rush. <sighs> you yeah. got to breathe, exactly. and then it, it all happens and it, it goes by. But it's it's good. And you're right. Uh, there are some headaches in there as yeah. well. So that's kind of why we have our next next guest on today, Dave, with mm-hmm. us. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. John Wald. He's a neurologist with us here at Henry Ford Allegiance Health. Welcome, Dr. Wald. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the warm welcome. Yeah. Um, and we we kind of joke about headaches, um, but it is a serious business I mean, because, you know, once they get worse, we mm-hmm. people end up getting migraines and it, it's, uh, yeah, it can cause a lot of problems for individuals, you know, in daily life and all that. Um but I want to step back first because I, I know I said you're a neurologist. Um, my wife had her her friend um, had some appointments with a neurologist and a neurosurgeon, and things got canceled because they thought they were seeing the same person <laughs> for this for something similar. And I think a lot of people hear neuro at the front of you know something. a title, and it's all it's all neuro brain, and then that's it. Can can you talk to me about like a little bit about what you do as a neurologist? Absolutely. So neurologists evaluate and treat disorders of the brain, spinal cord, nerve, and muscle. We do that by examining patients, by doing some electrical tests, blood tests, and looking at scans. The goal is to come up with a diagnosis and then a treatment that helps people. And that is different than your neurosurgeon who is looking at the same structures, but for the most part, they have an eye towards anything that could be corrected surgically. So if it's something obvious that needs surgery, someone might go directly to a neurosurgeon. But more often than not, they might see a neurologist first, and we would do the evaluation, come up with a diagnosis. And if we find something that would need surgical correction, refer them to the neurosurgeons who just so happen to be right down the hall from me in our office. So you work as a team. I mean, really, this is the big thing that people understand is probably their first step is seeing you and then potentially seeing a neurosurgeon. Exactly. Okay. So, and I mentioned migraines and headaches being, um, you know, getting them over the holidays, but it is more serious for certain individuals. Um, Mm -hmm. How are migraines defined? I'm fortunate. I don't, I haven't had a migraine that I know of ever in my entire life. So, Well, that wouldn't be surprising because migraine tends to be a disease of younger women more than men. Mm -hmm. Um, Partly has to do with hormone fluctuation. One thing you don't want to do is tell someone with migraine that you get headaches too because they'll be offended. (laughs) Everyone gets some kind of a headache, some pain here at the end of a bad day. Uh, Usually goes away with rest, Tylenol, or something else. Migraine, on the other hand, can be a really debilitating condition. Mm. There may be a warning sign beforehand of vision uh, blurring, flashing lights in the vision, or even numbness or weakness on half the body. This can be followed by really severe throbbing pain anywhere in the brain, or excuse me, anywhere in the head coming from the brain. Mm -hmm. There might be a loss of vision or photophobia, which is a term for lights bothering you, sounds bothering you. Uh, smells may bother you. There can be a lot of nausea, a lot of vomiting, and folks can be down for a day or more with a migraine. It's really debilitating and it's unpredictable. Yeah. Wow. And so that's, I imagine when, I, when you list off all those things, that's probably very scary for individuals if they're having their, their first migraine because I imagine they don't know what's going on. Absolutely. Sometimes the first migraine actually is diagnosed in the emergency department, and it might have been thought of to be a stroke. And before we get the appropriate testing done to confirm it's it's a migraine, I won't say simply a migraine because it's devastating, but it's not as bad as a stroke. Yeah. And are there a lot of, I mean, I know you said it's, yeah, it occurs in younger women. Are there a lot of 
Is it common? I mean, is it, how common is our migraines for? Oh, nearly twenty percent of the young women population will have some forms of migraine. Luckily, most of them are going to have something I would term as episodic migraine, meaning it's occurring occasionally, and hopefully we can stop it. But there's a smaller percentage that will have something we call chronic migraine, which is sixteen or more days a month of having migraine and headaches. Sometimes it's thirty days a month where people oh are God. suffering from this type of pain. It's, it probably makes, I imagine it's, it's, I can imagine functioning <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, many that. of them don't function terribly well. They're afraid of missing work. They miss uh, enjoyable events, graduations, parties, holidays can be disrupted by the unpredictable nature of these yeah. migraines. And you mentioned unpredictable. Is, I guess, are there triggers or are there things you look for when you're, you're talking to patients, you know, on, on what's causing migraines or when you're trying to diagnose things? Are there common Often we find triggers, not always. Some of the more common triggers might be foods. Um, a big one is caffeine. Either too much caffeine or suddenly stopping caffeine can trigger a migraine. Lack of sleep or poor sleep can be a migraine trigger. Certain smells, certain lights can trigger migraines. Um, most people, if there is a trigger, they identify it sooner or later, though we do try to evaluate for them. And if we find triggers, we try to avoid the triggers, obviously. Mm -hmm. And if... If they can't, you know, obviously eliminate caffeine. If it's, if caffeine's not a trigger, you know, I know for me it is. Dave, it would be for you too if you stopped drinking coffee. Yeah, if I stopped. We both get headaches if we stop. <laughs> we don't get enough caffeine. But, um, you know, what? I guess what's the next step when, when, when they're, you know, triggers, when you're kind of defining these things out, I guess treatment probably, right? Absolutely. And we think of treatment in two different ways. If someone is having a migraine right now, we want to use a medication that will take care of today's headache right now, get rid of it as quickly as possible with as few side effects as possible. And in the last 30 years that I've done this, we went from having almost no good medication to get rid of headaches to now having quite a few. Um, there's actually been several new developments uh, just in the last year with a, a whole new class of medications that work very well oral medications. Mm -hmm. And then we also think of prevention. And if someone's having more than a couple of migraines in a week, that's the time to see a neurologist or someone that can um, find ways to prevent these. Uh, we have quite a number of medications at our disposal. Um, some blood pressure medications are effective. Some of the older anti-seizure medicines are effective. And then we have a great number of new medications just in the last few years called monoclonal antibodies, which are injections that the patient can give themselves. They're quite effective at preventing migraine. And then there's a treatment I've done for nearly 30 years that can prevent migraine. It's called Botox, or um, it's got a long name, but there's a <laughs> class of medicines called neurotoxins that all work similarly. And Botox specifically is injected into the forehead, side of the head, back of the head, neck and shoulders by me. Someone couldn't do that themselves. Mm -hmm. About once every 12 weeks. And when we do this, we can find a dramatic reduction in the number of migraines over the three-month period mm -hmm. and the severity of the migraines during the three-month period. I thought it was so interesting because you hear Botox and you don't necessarily think of a medical application like that. You always hear that it's used for like skin treatment or things like that. But it's kind of interesting to see how it can like go beyond that and really help someone. Interesting story. Uh, you're exactly right. When I start to first mention Botox to people, they instantly think, oh, do you think my wrinkles are that bad? Because that, <laughs> a lot of people associate Botox and wrinkles. But yeah. Botox has been around for 30 years. And the first 20 years of it, we didn't use it that often for migraine. We use it for a number of other medical conditions, including spasticity, which is when muscles are very mm -hmm. tight and can't be relaxed. Some other movement disorders, there's a fairly uncommon disorder where the head may turn or where the eyes may close. And I can inject the appropriate muscles and also stop that type of wow. activity for about 12 weeks. But... Um, Another interesting fact is it was plastic surgeons and dermatologists who first discovered that Botox might work for migraine because they were injecting around the forehead and around the eyes to treat the wrinkles. And yep. their patients, usually young women, were coming back and saying, not only do I look better, but my headaches are better. Then we, as the neurology um, science, ran with that, and we did a number of clinical trials. We've actually done some of the trials here at Henry Ford Allegiance and ultimately did find the best dose, the best pattern to inject the Botox to prevent the migraines. Wow. That's great. And you yourself have been doing studies on other things as well. 
Um, well, I've studied Botox for many, many mm -hmm. reasons. I do other studies here as well. We're doing a study um, using Botox for, or we've done a study using Botox for spasticity. We've done studies in Botox and migraine, comparing it to other of the more standard oral medications. We're mm -hmm. currently doing a study using a new form of a neurotoxin. It wouldn't be called Botox, but it's a similar drug. And we're going to do it in a somewhat different pattern throughout the head to see if we the new toxin and the new pattern might provide better benefit than the current uh, paradigm using Botox. Wow, that's pretty cool. Are there certain like, I guess, types of migraines or, or certain sources of pain that I guess when you look at using Botox, you say maybe we should use a oral medication or maybe we should use Botox instead? Yeah, there's a lot that goes into this, but Botox specifically is used for the type of migraine that we diagnose as chronic migraine. And so this uh, is a diagnosis with before treatment where people are having eight migraine days and 15 or more headache days per month. If they're having fewer than that, it wouldn't make sense to, to treat so aggressively. So if they're chronic migraine, Botox is a great choice, but it's just weighing the patient's um, lifestyle, the patient's priorities. Some patients could never give them selves an injection once a month in their thigh. Others do it with no problem. Mm -hmm. Some patients don't want to take a pill every day. Some patients just love it that every quarter I inject their forehead and they do well. <laughs> they always have no, the, the, no wrinkles as they age and, and no headaches. If you have to have a side effect of a treatment, that's a pretty good side effect. <laughs> I, I would say that. That'd be great. Um, so like how often then are you seeing patients that this is working for? I mean, is there is there a large portion that's working for? Or I mean... Well, in my practice, my experience, at least 90% of patients do very well. It does take some handling of expectations. Um, the patients come in, and the first time we start the usual dose, the usual pattern, 12 weeks later, if they haven't done as well as I hope, I might do a little more or change the pattern. 12 weeks later, do the same. So it might take up to nine months to get the treatment tailored to exactly how we like it. But once that occurs, patients will do well for a long time. I've injected some people with... Botox and other neurotoxins for nearly 30 years now. Wow. Hmm. And they've been, they've been obviously doing well and they've been happy. I, mean, <sighs> it, it, I gotta imagine that's, um, they can function again. Because before that it was probably very difficult. It's really life changing for people. Um, they can't believe that they've gone a year without having a headache, that they're back to work, that they're going to events without having to worry or pre plan of what kind of medicines to take or how to handle it if they suddenly get a migraine. Sometimes, actually, it's almost um, depressing to them to think back all the things they missed, and they just wish so much this treatment was available 20 years ago to them, and it wasn't. But that's the nature of medicine. We keep advancing and finding new and better treatments. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, amazing. I just, I, I think about, you know, I have a nephew who actually deals with migraines but like you mentioned it's it's random and is maybe once a month maybe so it's really hard for them to diagnose mm -hmm. but you know for people that you can that can use this treatment it's it's life-changing so that that's pretty awesome is there something that people can like notice in their behaviors or some tips for helping to prevent headaches well I, i'll give you an example <clears throat> i know my wife and she she can get a migraine every once in a while, but she has headaches a lot. Um, she drinks, starts drinking water because she's like, I'm dehydrated. And that's one of those first things. Are there's just some common, simple things that people can do to kind of prevent headaches from getting worse? Um, well, the first and most um, common way we can prevent migraines and keep from them getting worse is working on sleep. Generally having mm. the same bedtime, getting up the same time in the morning, getting a good solid restful sleep, it's a good way to prevent migraine. When people do get a headache, getting to sleep and uh, sleeping it off can be very helpful. And then the other really simple thing is just caffeine management. Um, generally, two cups of coffee or the equivalent every day is not a problem, but people that are using much, much more than that may start bringing on migraines or people that use much more than quit. So I'll see people that um, drink tons of caffeine <laughs> all week, then suddenly it becomes 
Saturday morning, they're sleeping in till 10 or 11 because they're exhausted. They don't have anything stressful going on, but they haven't got their coffee and they have a rip roaring migraine that wrecks their whole weekend. Sometimes we'll call this a letdown headache. People that are just go, go, go mm -hmm. for the full week. As soon as they get a chance to relax, out comes the migraine wrecking their weekend. So those people, if we get them to get up the same time as they usually do, maybe drink a little bit of their normal caffeine, stay on a normal schedule, they can often prevent these things quite well. If someone is getting migraines and they have treatments, even if there are over-the-counter treatments that can be effective, um, anti-inflammatories for some people, um, Tylenol even, mm -hmm. uh, taking it earlier is good. However, we want to be careful with not too frequent use. There is right. a form of, of migraine that we've actually studied here. It's called medication overuse headache, where someone is having a migraine maybe once or twice a week. They often are using a combination medication such as Excedrin, which contains caffeine. Mm. And suddenly they're using it three or four times a week. And pretty soon they come see me and they're using 20 or 30 capsules of Excedrin every single week because they have a headache every single day. Wow. They can't sleep. They don't realize they have so much caffeine and all the Excedrin they're taking. They're over-caffeinating themselves. So what we did in, in that study is we added one of the preventatives, and then we just looked at was it better to tell someone abruptly stop the medication you're overusing or gradually wean off of it. And the interesting thing is we found both worked as long as we started something new that was a prevention, and we educated the patient that this medicine wasn't helping them. It was actually the, the one they were overusing wasn't helping them. It was hurting them. And once we got them off, they've done very well. And I still see many of these people now years later where they were medication overuse, 30 headache days a month, taking medicine all day, every day. They don't have migraines anymore. They rarely need one of the newer medicines to get rid of a headache when they get it. It's, that was another life-changing event for them. So it sounds like sometimes it's just a lot of it is just stepping back. You, you can come at it with a perspective that the individual doesn't have. They, you know, they think they're trying to help with certain things or doing this to fix it or doing this to fix it. And you kind of have that perspective of like, wait, let's step back. Hmm. Maybe, you know, it's not always medication. I think that's probably one of the things that people, there is medication available, but sometimes it's, it's more things than that, that you take a look at. Behavioral. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's why it's always wise to have this looked at by someone that understands headache and migraine if they're getting out of hand in any way. Yeah. Hmm. I guess I'm lucky. <laughs> Dave and I have a lot of caffeine, and we you don't have migraines? I've never had I'm, one. I'm lucky. Knock on wood. But. Yeah, knock on wood, yes. So, and and is I guess another question I would have, are migraines, is it hereditary at all? Does it run in families? It, it, sure, it sure does. It more often is a mom transmitting it to daughters. So there is a genetic component that then is acted on by estrogen that goes up and down with the mm. monthly cycle. And many women will have headaches in association with that menstrual cycle. Hmm. So our wives can kind of not can not completely blame us when yeah. we give them a migraine. Well, <laughs> I joke sometimes. <laughs> migraines tend to start around the same time that girls start having periods. And so is it the fact that they're having periods or that's the same time men start coming around and bothering them? And <laughs> one of the two is causing the migraines. Yeah. Or both yeah. not helping. So, yeah, we could both adding to it. So... <laughs> Well, Dr. Wald, I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of come in here and talk to us, explain migraines, and, and, and talk about you know some of the treatments that, that we have available. Yeah. Um, yeah, my pleasure. As you can see, a lot of migraine treatment is actually patient um, education and setting expectations. And so if we can do this and help a broader uh, group of folks, I'm happy to be part of it. Great. Thank you so much. And and uh, I want to let everybody know that they can find you at Henry Ford Allegiance Neurology, um, and Dr. John Wald. Uh, thank you for coming on our show. And if you need more information, go to henryford.com. So thank yep. you, Dave. And more podcasts at henryford.com slash podcast. And uh, on iTunes and Spotify and Facebook and all those places. So thanks for listening and thanks for joining us today. <laughs>